Hello there, I'm sure you've seen the odd movie or two where the ship has been launched with the breaking of a bottle of bubbly and the phrase And my God bless her and all who sail on her. This superstition and tradition dates back centuries, was certainly around when this vessel, Hini Mawa, was launched in 1819. To start with, I need to differentiate that this vessel in this podcast is a sailing ship home port to start with, Liverpool. The specs I'll get to, it's not the New Zealand flag steamer by the same name. That's the SS Hinimoa. You may have heard of about that. It used to travel around the sub-Antarctic islands looking for castaways, restocking huts and dropping off scientists and botanists, that sort of thing. Forget that Hinimoa. This Hinimoa only made one trip to NZ, an eventful one, but before I get into the meat, I better paint a picture of sailing on the ocean to a faraway place like New Zealand was at that time when steam was just about to take over from sail, thus reducing the transit, thankfully. Ocean travel back then was a pig of a thing. Historically, the journey for those setting out to New Zealand was and remains the longest migration journey ever. Let me repeat, English European immigrants to New Zealand undertook the longest journey at sea, not just for the time, ever. Average, 100 days at sea. If the weather was crap, or in the doldrums, when the sails weren't flapping, add a month to that. Shaw Savile had a totally different meaning to immigrants, confined to a shared steerage, which is virtually a on-water barn compared to that of today's state-of-the-art cruise ships there was no evening buffet a tacky onboard souvenir shops free cocktail vouchers sailing the ocean blue a sing-along this was not go back to say 1880 and if you were the in the equivalent of today's cattle class it was a cramp dark infested with ticks cockroaches and lice luckily for the passengers they had mice and rats to feast on those pests. Outbreaks of diarrhoea, measles, scarlet fever, TB, any infectious disease under the sun you can name, were all the norm. Even today, cruise ships are floating petri dishes. In February of this year, 2024, a Norwegian cruise ship with 3,000 passengers and crew were denied permission to make an emergency docking in Mauritius after an outbreak of cholera. Let me summarise how bad it was to be on board a sailing ship travelling to New Zealand for the first immigrants. The odds of a baby dying during that time at sea was 1 in 5. There are documented cases where tormented passengers threw themselves into the ocean rather than enduring the rigours any longer. What today we now call white privilege. That's if you were lucky to be on a ship that even made it intact in the first place, didn't sink. One in a hundred did, fourteen in total. Two of them vanished completely. One of those was the Matawaka going back to London in May 1869. The legacy of the southward journey for the Matawaka and Kiwis live with today. In her hold were the first cages from Mother England, full of sparrows, thrushes and blackbirds. The descendants of those are merely flapping about Kiwi Gardens today. The Matawaka and her 77 passengers were last seen sailing out of the Godly Heads Littleton. Now rest at the bottom of the ocean, somewhere between New Zealand and South America. Not that things were any better for the crew. They didn't get a Get Out of the Sick Bay card when disease broke out, underpaid and kept under quasi-navy-like rule, poorly fed and housed, they weren't exempt all those privations. It was a given on any long passengers, one or two of the crew would go AWOL in stopover ports, fight each other and the brig would be full. What shall we do with the drunken sailor was an allegorial tune, not a ten-year-old sing-along. This leads us to our ship, the striking four-masted 278 foot long Hinimoa. Few claims to fame on the plus side of the ledger. 
then it goes rapidly downhill. One was the first four-masted bark to visit down under. Two was incredibly fast on her one visit to New Zealand, Liverpool to Wellington, 78 days, motoring. Three was the one and only sailing ship designed and equipped with freezing machinery to transport lamb and mutton back to the UK. Not to be sniffed at, 20,000 carcasses. Refrigeration facilities would later be removed and replaced with just plain old bulk storage for general goods. Four, also installed, an expectance a fishing opportunity would present itself. Freezers capable of preserving a catch were already installed. A trawling plant, anyone listening to this who can enlighten us as to the prevalence of these vessels are doubling as trawlers, plonk it in the comments on YouTube. Now the fun and games start. The Hinney Mower rolled into Wellington December 1892. Literally rolled. The vessel was listing. The ship's ballast having rolled to one side. The origin of this ballast is the origin to the legend the ship was cursed. First up, my spooky voices from the grave effect. And those rocks were taken from a Liverpool cemetery. Trip 1 wasn't getting off to a good start. Wellington authorities did assist in the redistribution of the rocks. Went that keen of the crew with typhoid setting foot onshore. The vessel was sent south to the port of Christchurch in the South Island, Littleton. The three crew with typhoid fever were let off, whisked into isolation in Littleton. It would be a good decade before an effective typhoid vaccine was available. Another one to exit the vessel was a sailor who had spent a few weeks locked up in Hinney Marsbrook. He had refused to obey orders and unduly influence his crewmates to do a recreation of the bounty. He was led straight to the courtroom in Littleton then spent 10 days in the neighbouring jail. The crew now had some time to while away whilst waiting for the shipment of meat to come together. Take one guess, what did these sailors get up to? In one old folk tune. was strolling around the port township of Littleton one day when one of his crew collared him after rolling out of the local pub with a belly full of a piss he berated the captain about wages and onboard conditions basically the captain dismissed the bloke's issues and told him to piss off and got smacked in the mouth for his trouble another crew member ends up in the Littleton jail this wraps up Voyage 1, and it wouldn't get any better. It didn't help any. Pub rumours now had it the vessel was cursed. Voyage 2, 1894, from Port Downs in Kent to Melbourne. The same captain as before. He went insane. The crew ended up taking over the navigation and running of the vessel. Voyage 3, 1895, from Lizard Point, Cromwell to Melbourne. The replacement captain, well he went on a bender. What do we do with the habitually drunken captain? throw him in the brig until he dried out, leave him at port for the return journey. Voyage 4, 1901, Newcastle, New South Wales to San Francisco. By now the superstition the vessel was cursed had really taken hold. 
wouldn't have helped any when the captain on this voyage was discovered by US authorities to be smuggling contraband. On the return journey, the vessel was almost sunk in a storm. Two of the crew were blown overboard and went back into harbour a month overdue. Voyage 5, 1902, Friedrichstraat, Norway to Melbourne. The trip south was, believe it or not, uneventful. At least for a time, the captain on this vessel would later go on to be at the helm of a minesweeper, go to his cabin one evening, and then inexplicably <laughs> blew his brains out. Voyage 6, 1908, and coming back from Melbourne to the United Kingdom. Lawn Jetty, or Lawn Pier, is exactly as the name suggests. Today it's a bit of a tourist attraction not too far from Geelong, 150 kilometres, give or take, south of Melbourne. The original purpose of the jetty wasn't for day trippers or recreational fishermen, it was to load timber. Whilst the Hinimawa was navigating round the south of the state of Victoria to reach Adelaide, South Australia, somehow the heavily laden vessel ploughed straight into the pier, then became stranded and had to be towed off. Let me think what could have been the cause of this massive navigational blunder. Cue the tune. The vessel then was all but mothballed for a decade, so propulsion gradually becoming yesterday's technology. The vessel's two subsequent owners went bust, operating a fleet of now uncompetitive vessels. Then World War One broke out. Britain was desperate for every vessel they had to be put into good use and keep the supply chain flowing. The Germans knew if they could sink enough of these cargo ships, they could starve the country into submission, greatly reduce the capacity to fight, in this, the first war of mass production. The requisitioned Hinnie Mower was back in business. On the hunt for plump targets were the German U-boats. Voyage 7, on September the 7th, 1917, about 200 kilometres east of Plymouth Port, UK. The unarmed Hinnie Mower is minding her own business when up pops a German U-boat, pointing their deck gun in her direction. They directed the crew to get into the lifeboats and abandon ship, which they did. Then the U-boat opened fire. The Hinnie Mower went to the bottom. An inquisitive British trawler was also sunk less than an hour later. The fate of the last crew on board the Henny Mower? Well, they all survived and made it back to English soil. The unpossessed type. Phew! In summary, the vessel itself was magnificent, impressive. I've done a harbour, hafen, tour of Hamburg port. Moored there is a similar four-masted sailing ship of the similar vintage. It's called the Peking. There are therefore surviving examples to Gorkak. As to the Hinimawa being cursed by the graveyard boulders, more like it was cursed by a series of incompetent buffoons. Very least, bloody unlucky. What say you? If you're watching this on YouTube, let me know in the comments. Thanks to those that support my late life hobby podcast, like hearing things NZ from a Kiwi's perspective. Let's now go out on that ghostly voices for a change. Bye for now.